You know, it's funny, the last time I was surrounded by this many hooligans was probably about six years ago in a Special Forces team room. So it feels good to be here with you guys tonight. And I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to be here tonight and spend a little time with the happy hooligans and to share a few of my thoughts with you. Now, I'm not quite the prolific speaker that uh, either General Haugen or Brandon is, so you'll see me looking down here. I got some stuff scratched down just so I kind of stay on track. But I have a few things that, that I just want to share with you, and uh, basically it's going to come from the world according to REM. Um, it's not doctrine. Uh, it's none of those types of things. So obviously I'm going to throw it out there, and it's yours to uh, do with as you see fit. I believe this banquet events like it are critical to our organizational development and that they provide a much needed vehicle by which we can recognize the accomplishments of our soldiers and airmen, and especially those in the first stages of what we all hope will be long and uh, fruitful careers. And I'm talking more to that, uh, you know, that guy probably 10 years or less in. Uh, so I don't want the, uh, the senior NCOs that are up on the block tonight, God bless you for your leadership. Uh, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight is probably going to be more oriented uh, towards or, or about in referencing the, the younger people. Am I missing this mic like crazy or are we all right? We good back there? Okay. What I intend to do is spend the next few minutes discussing two of my primary areas of interest with you. And I believe these two areas will be instrumental to our organizational development as we maneuver through the current period of transition in the military. As we travel along the path that our nation's military will take into the 21st century, we must keep in mind that there are going to be changes, there's going to be obstacles, there's going to be challenges and operations out there that will challenge us as we have never been challenged before. Some of that's happening already. The structure of the military is changing to meet the anticipated future needs of the nation. Those decisions are made way above our pay grade. And in today's operational environment, you normally cannot anticipate when the next engagement will be. You must condition yourself mentally to expect it at any time. And there are no front lines, so once you're in the target, zone, target nation, there is no safe zone. The days of the conventional warfare where you get behind a certain uh, parameter or, or a lo parallel line of longitude uh, you know, and, and that's kind of like the, the okay area, those days are gone. You in target nation, it's game on. Potential force structure changes will bring changes in tactics, and this coupled with the ongoing need for our operational expertise will present obstacles to our efficiency. We need to welcome these challenges as they provide us the means by which we can demonstrate our flexibility, our ability to adapt, and our professionalism. And no matter the challenge we are confronted with, we will succeed if we maintain focus on two areas. These are two main areas I want to discuss with you tonight. We must gain an understanding of those we lead, as well as a respect for their capabilities. And we must, we must, it is a mandate, provide solid leadership. Every war from the revolution to present that this nation is engaged in has presented new challenges for its warriors. This one is no different in that respect. The inability to identify the enemy or his weapon systems was and continues to be among the greatest challenges faced by the patriots waging the war in Iraq. They time and time again rise to the challenge, face the danger of the unknown with focused determination, and exhibit the requisite character and professionalism to successfully complete all missions assigned them. Now we are here tonight to honor those airmen who have distinguished themselves this past year. With that in mind, I'd like to take the opportunity to pass on to you my thoughts on the young people serving our country today and their generation as a whole. But before I do that, I want to play something for you. Uh, this, this short little clip, it's only about a 50 second gig is from, I believe, November of 03, uh, when we were over in Iraq. So, Eric, if you're ready, if you could run that for me, please. I think there's been a, a generation or a generation and a half that's been sold a little short. You hear about the Mii generation and the Nintendo generation. You hear all these, these labels that are put on people, and uh, um, I, I haven't seen that. I, I think it's maybe not enough has been expected or demanded of, of people at times in... Uh, you know, therefore, they haven't 
show them what all they're capable of. Uh, we've demanded a lot of these people in, uh, like I said earlier, they've continued to produce. Uh, they've, they've met and exceeded our expectations in, uh, I would have to say, in, in every facet of what we've done over here. Um, so I'd just like people to know that there's, uh, America's youth is, there's, there's not a major problem with America's youth. Uh, they're, they're strong, good, solid citizens, and, and they're over here making the best of a yeah, less than great situation. Uh, no different than the people who have gone before them and done this in other conflicts. I can't believe I said less than a great situation. Can you believe that? <laughs> Boy, if I could have that sentence back. I stand by the rest of it firmly. As this is my belief that there is character, hope, and a willingness to serve a greater cause that's prevalent in the youth of today. I personally have heard the unwarranted generational labels one too many times for my liking. The Nintendo generation, Generation X, me generation, or but a few such labels. All but a handful of the soldiers that I had over there with the 957th Multi-Role Bridge Company were in a combat environment for the first time in their lives, and most never imagined they would have ever been there. The majority of these soldiers were young as they always are, young with hopes and dreams for the future. Some of those dreams will go unfulfilled for eternity, and this is the reality and the seriousness of what we all do. While there is little doubt that there are those in every generation who do not exhibit the best of character, I have seen our young soldiers commit themselves to a greater cause. I have witnessed firsthand their willingness to risk their lives for another soldier in trouble. Of those thought not capable, I have demanded excellence and not been disappointed. I encourage all of us to stop and take stock of ourselves and our actions. The next time we're tempted to label the youth of today, I think we need to ask ourselves as leaders a few questions before we say, well, that's not happening because that's Gen X, or that's a me generation thing, or that's a Nintendo generation thing, and that's why this thing isn't happening, that's why it isn't working. I think there's a few things we need to ask ourselves. I think we need to ask ourselves, have I lowered my expectations of them? Have I committed myself to excellence, thereby providing the example for them to follow? And have I provided the requisite leadership and guidance that they deserve? Don't misunderstand me. I'm a firm believer that individuals must be held accountable for their actions. But I see too many times, instead of leadership taking a stand, they simply shrug it off as a generational issue. And this does nothing to further the development of the individual or the cause of the nation. It's been said many times, but I think sometimes we, we don't live it as we should, in that leadership is not a popularity contest. Taking care of our subordinates does not necessarily mean making them happy. Right, Brandon? Yeah, remember, shot on. Sometimes taking care of your airmen is making them do what they do not want to do. We've got to remember airmen are people, soldiers are people. And what does that mean? It means they're imperfect beings. That means that they get tired, they take shortcuts, they respond to different motivators, and they come from different ability groups. There is no one-size-fits-all leadership te technique that works in all situations. Uh, the leader's basic job is to motivate the organization to accomplish the commander's intent. That's what it all boils down to, if we go back to basics. Leadership requires courage and integrity. Courage to accept the fact that probably no decision you make will be liked by all of those it impacts. Courage to do the right thing when no one is looking. And courage to accept, and this is, this is very important, the same level of risk that you ask your subordinates to take. Courage to discipline equitably those that you like as well that you, those that you uh, dislike on a personal basis. Oh no, well, I, I don't have any of that. Well, that, that, we all know that's crap, right? We like or dislike people based on our prejudices and, and our background and our belief systems, okay? But you have to separate that. And you, and you have to treat people equitably according to whatever rules or guidelines that you have, and we need to take that emotional side of it out of it. That's how we're going to become effective leaders or continue to be effective leaders.
Courage and integrity to tell your airmen the real deal, even when you anticipate the news will not be well received. And I would say that courage for me is difficult to sum up in a few words. A couple of dictionaries I tried to look it up in took no less than 10 lines to sum it up. But I think it puts it all in context when we look at the etymology of the word itself. That's probably the biggest word I'll use all night, etymology. I like that one. Three times removed, it comes from the Latin word cor, which is spelled C-O-R. And I'm sure I've got some Latin buffs out there that will tell you that cor means heart, courage, heart. If you have heart, not if you have a heart, but if you have heart, you are courageous. I don't believe in courage or bravely, bravery as it relates to fearlessness. Fear is natural, and all are subjected to its effects to one degree or another. I believe in character, and I believe in stupidity. When someone commits an act attributed to bravery, I believe that individual had the character which allowed them to commit to a cause greater than themselves, or they had such total disregard for the reality of the situation that they're classified in the Book of Remington as stupid. <laughs> character is developed. It's, it's not something we were, were born with. Uh, this development starts in childhood, and we continue to develop it through the course of our lives. Now, some of us are more character challenged challenge than others, but we must all work to improve it throughout the course of our lives. We can and must focus on improving character. It is perhaps the most fundamental element of leadership. Now, I make no claim to be of impeccable character. In fact, I have numerous character flaws which I can identify, which include, but are certainly not limited to, lack of patience, temperature, or temperature, <laughs> temper, at times lack of sympathy. <laughs> Imagine that, I've been said to have a lack of sympathy. Go figure. Um, I work hard to overcome these. Uh, and other personality traits which I feel negatively impact my character, okay? But none of us are perfect beings out there, but we need to continue to try to improve that character. What I can say, however, is that my decisions on how to get Sergeant Erickson and Specialist Fedig out of the kill zone were just that, how, not if. If was not an option. The mission briefs that I gave for those missions I was placed in charge of always included a statement that those going on a mission, that if we got hit, you will not be left behind. We will come back for you. Now this was not done out of bravado or because it sounded good or it was something I saw in a John Wayne flick 30 years ago. It was because my belief system, my character, would not allow me any wiggle room on this one. That belief system that forms my character started with my parents teaching me the golden rule. It was refined by observing my wife live her life according to her faith. And the belief in greater causes was cemented in who I am by my teammates while I was in special forces, who left no doubt in my mind that it was better to sacrifice whatever necessary for others on the field of battle than to concern oneself with self-preservation, only to return to live with the guilt of, I could have, I should have done more. Those are regrets none of us ever want to have. I made several decisions that day that put my soldiers in harm's way. Some of those decisions I had but a few seconds to make. Some of them were probably not the best, but it came down to basics. As we were going along, I had snapshots of the training I'd received in the past that just went through my thought process, like, you know, sparks coming out of a live wire. It just, because everything's happening at Mach 6, and it's happening in slow-mo at the same time, if you can imagine that. Some of the things that are flying through my head are, God, I got injured soldiers in a kill zone. There's no good options that are going to guarantee success. If I only take one truck back in, we're going to be outnumbered. When in doubt, go on the offensive and do something aggressive. You know, and then this is interjected with, damn, that was close. You know, you got some of that going on. Um, and then the old principles of close quarters combat when I was working counterterrorism uh, in SF, you know, speed, surprise, violence of action, these things are just popping out at me uh, as I try to go through and make some kind of an intelligent decision. But it's, you know, it's amazing how difficult something as, as simple as, we're, you know, we're all taught to assess the situation. It's, it's just incredible how difficult something like that can be. Um, I remember I saw black smoke at the back end of the vehicle going up in the air, and my first thought was, geez, something really bad just happened here but you don't process quick enough to know exactly what it was. Second thought, I'm not sure what happened, but I'm gonna look for targets. 
and that's exactly what I did. So as I'm engaging and we're going through the kill zone, um, I'm trying to get a status on my guys, trying to get a count on how many bad guys we're dealing with. And, uh, oh, by the way, try to keep my driver's head in the game so we can get out of there too. Um, so there was a lot of things going on, but it didn't matter exactly what happened. All I need to know was it was game on and I need to clear all the vehicles out of the kill zone, you know, the ones that weren't hit. Uh, here's another place where it was a prime example of where overanalyzing the situation could have been deadly. Um, just for those of you that may not be familiar with it, typically an ambush, excuse me, is initiated with the most casually producing weapon, which was their improvised explosive device. Then you seal off the ends of that kill zone with machine gun fire, and then you have interlocking fire that comes from everybody else. So the whole idea is to take, you know, if there's anything in there, you want to you want to take it out, and that's exactly what they did. Now, thank God the marksmanship wasn't what it should have been, or, or things could have been a, a heck of a lot worse. But there was a, there was a lot, the high volumes of fire uh, going through that kill zone, and it was well executed. All of that happened in less than three seconds. Okay, it's just a barrage. One minute you're driving down the road, and the next minute, um, as Brandon told you, of course, he, you know, took a nap on us there for a little bit after he got hit, but... Um, <laughs> No, well-deserved one, I might add. But as we went out, I estimated that enemy strength was probably between six and eight. And while I didn't like the odds, you know, it was one of those deals I, I figured they'd have to do. I, I considered calling in another vehicle, but the other vehicles in the convoy, we had a, a contact truck, which is like a maintenance truck, maintenance Hummer with two guys in it. Uh, I had a command Hummer where there was a lieutenant and his driver, and they had like a, a topper on the back. And then the other two Hummers, I had like all these people that I was carrying down there to rotate out on the river patrols. So you can imagine my, my concern with bringing one of those in and one of those taking an RPG hit, and now I've got people everywhere strewn out in this kill zone. Um, plus we're having some combo issues, you know, you get holes in the radio and... Uh, or in the antenna, not in the radio. Uh, so anyway, my decision was push everybody out a mile. Uh, I'll take take my chances with four guys I got in the vehicle with me. And so that's what I did. Um, you know, it was, again, it was a first fire fight for everybody, um, for all those folks, and, and I just decided to leave them at the reconsolidation point about a mile. This along with fighting our way out the first time, assessing enemy strengths and weighing options all led to me telling the driver to turn around and go back in. And I think I also used some verbiage that probably wouldn't impress neither my wife or my mother. Um, but my, my driver's response was predictable. He looked me in the eye and said, what? And um, I, I do need to say that I have no doubt uh, in his willingness, as he proved himself throughout the engagement sequence many times. Uh, but maybe secretly he was hoping he had misunderstood my order. That decision on which the following decisions were made uh, had to be made in around 20 seconds from the initiation of the IED and in the midst of what we call the fog of war, uh, where, you know, confusion reigns supreme. Um, months later, Brandon told me of uh, insurgents being within 50 yards of the vehicle as we were going out, as we started to come back, they were within 50 yards, no doubt uh, come to finish what they had started, you know, as far as he's concerned. In uh, so I didn't know it at the time, but uh, 30 seconds probably would have been too long and too late to make that decision to spin around and come back in. Now, we're never going to know that, and the only reason I put that out there is not that, hey, look at this great call I made, and da-da-da-da-da. It's more so when that happens, you need to achieve clarity as quickly as you can, and you need to make some decision versus being paralyzed uh, by by you know, trying to be so sure that you make the right decision. Start doing something, and then you'll just kind of work your way through it, okay, in a crisis situation. And that's what I'm trying to get across there. Um, you know, when I talk about characters, it relates to me only to hopefully give insight that while I will never deny that the good fortune I had to receive the training that I did and to serve with the caliber of people I did has enabled me, but it's a character that we develop in ourselves that truly allows us to do what is necessary. If we just identify what is important to us and what we truly believe before we're faced with tough decisions, those decisions will not necessarily be easy, but clarity will come to you at the moment of truth because you will be driven by what you believe in. Your belief system will drive you and you will make the right decision. It may not turn out good for you. Um, I could sit here and list a laundry list of, of 
close things had they gone a little bit different on that day um, people would probably today be saying what the hell was Kevin Remington thinking that day and that's that's just the truth of the matter because there's several times where we had good luck okay it had nothing to do with the decisions I made or the efforts the guys were making a lot of good things were done on in those areas but we got lucky um, to me the greatest demonstration of character that day was a group of guys in their first engagement who fought their way in and out of a kill zone no less than four round trips. Think for a minute about these guys' situation. They were in their first firefight. The guy they thought knew his way around was no longer in the vehicle because I bailed on the first trip to try to work these guys. And they had to fight their way back in and out each time against machine gun and RPG fire. And now one of those four ever got out of the kill zone and said, I can't go back in there again. These guys were totally out of the kill zone. They had to turn around and come back in. Now that was four times. Four times I asked them to do that. Their only concern was that they needed to get Erickson Fetting and the old honorary one out of there. That's heart. That's courage. Or the young soldier with life-threatening injuries, also in his first firefight, not sure what happened to him, with the increasing efforts to, or effects of shock due to blood loss, who at one point asked what the status of the other guy is, and that's Brandon Erickson. That's courage. I realize that I'm the only thing between you guys and in, in finding out who the winners are. I'm about ready for another taste of that Miller Lite, so I'll try to wrap this up with just a few final thoughts. Mission success is job one. It's all about commander's intent. It's all about achieving the mission end state. We've got to keep that in mind. We do this while taking the best possible care of our subordinates that we can, but I want you to think about something. If we say people first, then we would not do the dangerous job that is required of us. How could we ever go on a dangerous mission if we always said people first? Now again, remember what I said, mission first, and we take the best possible care of our people that we can while accomplishing that mission. But the mission has got to have the priority. We cannot lose sight of the overall driving force, the reason that our organization exists. We exist to accomplish the missions we are given to support our governor's intent in peacetime emergency or to support the president's intent in shaping U.S. foreign policy abroad. We have a fantastic resource at our disposal the young person today is capable of and willing to provide excellence. I'm encouraged by them, and I'm optimistic for the future of our nation. If we as leaders do our part, they most certainly will do theirs. And in this time of national crisis, I ask that we all go forward and do the best that we possibly can in whatever capacity we now serve. And I'll close with three thoughts. To our young airmen out there, you are the future of this organization and truly without a doubt our greatest resource. Nothing good happens in this organization without you as a part of it. Do not accept mediocrity in yourselves and continue to strive for excellence in all that you do as so many of you have done that are here tonight to be recognized. Leaders, when in charge, by God be in charge. Do not ask your subordinates to do anything you haven't done before or not truly willing to do. Lead by example. And remember that the less than perfect decision is better than no decision at all. The youth of today are like the youth of yesterday in that they will rise to whatever level of excellence we demand of them. I'd like to say congratulations to our honorees. It has been an honor to be here with you this evening. God bless you all for your service to your country and Godspeed in all your future endeavors.